My name is Molly Crockett. I am an assistant professor of psychology at Yale University, and my lab is interested in human morality. There's been a lot of research trying to uncover the psychological and neural mechanisms of moral judgments and moral decisions. And many of these studies have tried to understand the extent to which the processes involved in more moral judgments and behavior are more rational, deliberative, planned, goal-directed versus more automatic, impulsive, maybe emotional, reflexive. I think this is very complicated and I think it's not the right question to ask whether morality is reflective or reflexive, automatic or deliberative, but rather to try and understand in what contexts or maybe in what individuals are moral processes likely to be driven by these different mechanisms. And in my lab, we use computational models to try and better characterize how these processes unfold in the mind and the brain. And the computational approach, I think, is a really useful way to address this question because it forces you to specify very uh, concretely what is meant by deliberative or um, impulsive. Um, for example, there's a distinction in computer science between model-based algorithms and model-free algorithms, which use different procedures to learn the value of different actions. And various projects have, in my lab are looking at how well model-based and model-free algorithms can characterize moral judgments and moral decisions. This is something that we don't have a good answer for yet, but it's definitely a question that we're interested in. So in lab experiments, we found that when people form impressions of agents based on observing decisions that those agents make, which can be more sort of harmful or helpful type decisions, we find people form very quickly impressions of the moral character of these agents. So it's very, it's very easy for people to, to learn who's a good guy and who's a bad guy, and of course this is consistent with decades of research in social psychology. What we found that's new is that the beliefs about the moral character of bad agents are more uncertain and more flexible than the beliefs about good agents. So if you learn that somebody is pretty good and trustworthy, you kind of park that belief and you don't update it as quickly as you update your beliefs about someone you think might be bad. And this makes sense because people often behave in ways that are harmful by mistake. So if you accidentally form an impression of somebody that's bad but that turns out to be wrong, you need to be able to update that belief in order to sort of carry on with social life. And of course if you start to form an impression of somebody who's bad and they actually turn out to be worse than you thought, you also really want to be able to update in the bad direction as well. It's a totally open question whether these impression formation processes follow the same type of pattern for judgment of people's behavior online. Um, one idea that we might test at some point is that a lot of the interactions that take place on social media platforms are maybe uh, less nuanced or less rich than the kinds of interactions we have offline. So you don't see someone's face, you see an avatar. You don't hear their tone of voice, you're just looking at a few lines of text that they've written. So it's a really fascinating question how this would affect our beliefs about the character of others. On the one hand, because the information is so sparse, then maybe our impressions would be much more, un more uncertain. But on the other hand, because the algorithms that determine what information we see on social media are selecting for content that's really emotional or really extreme, you know, content that's going to drive engagement, then maybe the information that we're seeing about other people is not necessarily representative of the, their behavior as a whole. And if it's more extreme, then that might lead to more kind of um, rigid impressions of other people. So I don't know the answer, but it's a really, really interesting question. 
Absolutely, and I think it's very important to be clear that our research on this topic is not making any normative claims about whether outrage is on the whole a good thing or a bad thing, whether that be online or offline. Like, outrage has positive consequences and it has negative consequences. And whether it's inherently good or bad is not a question that I think science can necessarily answer. There's a lot of really great philosophical work on this topic. Um, and philosophers have a lot of uh, really important contributions to make to these, to these conversations. Um, the way I've been thinking about outrage is it is an emotion that evolved to serve a very specific function or set of functions. It's a way for us to signal what types of behaviors are, are socially unacceptable. It's a way to motivate the costly punishment of wrongdoing and in so doing provide really strong incentives to cooperate. And of course that's essential to the survival and evolution of our species that, that groups of humans can get together and cooperate for the good of everyone. And um, outrage, I think, has played a really important role throughout our evolution in disincentivizing bad behavior. There's another function which researchers have highlighted more recently, folks like Pat Barkley, Dave Rand, Jill Jordan, showing that not only does outrage motivate the shaming and punishment of wrongdoers, it also sends a signal to others about what kind of person you are. It sends a signal that you're outraged about something because you're not the kind of person who would do that thing. So it serves an important reputational function as well. So broadly, we can think of outrage having both social benefits in disincentivizing bad behavior and also personal benefits in sort of spreading the word to your social network how good of a person you are, how cooperative, you should choose me as a social partner, and so on. One open question that we've been interested in my lab is the extent to which these new technologies like social media might kind of change the balance between these social benefits and the personal benefits. So because on social media, if you express outrage about something, that gets broadcasted to your entire network of connections, that's going to potentially amplify the personal benefits of outrage beyond what we might experience typically offline. So you know, you hear a colleague make a sexist comment and you call them out on it and you get credit for that from you know, the three or four people who might also be watching. But if you tweet about it, you know, depending on how many followers you have, that might be a thousand or ten thousand or a million, millions of people who, who learn that you feel that way about that issue. So I think what we're seeing with social media is like a really, really dramatic change in the scale of how individual expressions can reach people, you know, broader social networks of people. Um, in terms of the social benefits of outrage, that is a really, really tricky question in terms of what social media is doing to those benefits. On the one hand, Social media gives voice to people who might not have had power to express outrage about topics, issues before social media. So especially by um, enabling people to connect with other like-minded individuals and band together. You know, movements like Black Lives Matter or Me Too, which are, are really important movements, maybe wouldn't have gotten the traction that they have gotten without social media. So in terms of amplifying the voices of people less powerful, uh, that could have very positive social consequences. One hypothesis, and this is something that we don't have a lot of data for yet, is if, if social media, through the way that it's designed, is just sort of dialing up the volume on outrage in general, and, and this is something we've, we've seen a little bit in, in data uh, if, you, if you ask people um, to report on how outraged they feel about witnessing immoral events, both offline and online, they re report feeling more outraged about things they, they witness or learn about online. Um, this is probably because the type of information that they're seeing online is very different from what you would encounter normally in your sort of offline daily life. If social media is just sort of indiscriminately dialing up the volume on outrage, 
then this could create a signal to noise problem where if everything is worthy of outrage, then effectively nothing is. And, and there's, there's a, a worry, and you know, this is a worry, we don't have solid data on this yet, that if everyone's shouting about stuff online, that it might make it harder for people to distinguish between the truly heinous and the merely disagreeable. Uh, and so the question is, well, what's getting lost in that noise? Um, so these are just questions that have come to mind that are sort of based on uh, my training in neuroscience and moral psychology and, and, and my, my colleagues and, and collaborators in my lab. And we're, we're now really actively trying to develop tools that will allow us to ask these questions. So tools that will allow us to measure outrage expressions at scale on social media so that we can test these hypotheses about you know, how it spreads and what kinds of, uh, what kinds of topics are, are, are triggering it and, and can, we, can we see uh, evidence for this signal to noise issue. Maybe it's not an issue. Maybe people do express more outrage about topics that others would independently rate as more morally severe. But without the tools, we can't ask or answer the questions. So the concept of a supernormal stimulus comes from biology, and the idea is that organisms have instinctual reactions to certain types of stimuli that have certain characteristics. And a supernormal stimulus is like uh, a prototypical stimulus on steroids. So in the case of outrage, there's a, a certain type of stimulus that triggers outrage. It's a you know, violation of, of a moral norm. And there are prototypical stimuli that we encounter in our daily lives that trigger you know, probably mild to moderate outrage. Someone cuts us off in traffic, or somebody's rude to us, somebody says a remark that's, that's off color, and we experience the emotion in response to that triggering stimulus. A supernormal stimulus that would trigger outrage would be one that would trigger a really extreme outrage response. Uh, and, and it's called supernormal in, in a sense because that stimulus is, is something that's potentially been engineered to provoke outrage and is not necessarily one that we would typically encounter in our daily lives. I think a lot of the fake news headlines that we saw in the lead up to the 2016 elections in the US uh, are really good examples of like super normal outrage stimuli where they're like larger than life and you know they, they're engineered to be that way. And I think that the, the hawkers of fake news, at least at an intuitive level, understood that outrage goes viral. And so if they're designing these headlines to go viral, they're, they're designing them to, to be extreme examples of, of stimuli that will you know, push all of those buttons. In thinking about how social media might amplify outrage, and this is of course just a set of hypotheses at the moment, we're testing these in data as we speak, um, there are a number of ways that the design of social media environments might amplify moral outrage. The first has to do with the, the, the stimuli that we encounter online and the way that information is selected to present to us. So social media platforms make more money the longer we stay on the platform. This means they have an incentive to present us with information that is most likely to draw us in, to keep us engaged, to keep us coming back and spending more and more time online. It's been shown through many different research approaches that the, the most engaging content is content that triggers emotions, particularly moral emotions like moral outrage and, and anger in general is, is one of the most engaging uh, types of, of emotion. So that means that algorithms built into these platforms that select information to show to us based on how engaging it's predicted to be, that's going to push to the top of our feeds content that is 
likely to trigger strong emotions like outrage. So that's the first component. The second component has to do with uh, how the design of platforms encourages us to share and, and spread outrage provoking content. So of course it's much easier to express outrage online than it is offline. It's really awkward to go up to somebody in real life if you think they've done something wrong. It's risky, they may retaliate against you, it takes time, you have to be in the same physical location as them. Whereas social media gives us the tools to express outrage very quickly and cheaply uh, from our, our bedroom or from a commuter train and we, don't, we can be halfway across the world from the, the person or the event that, that triggered the outrage. So um, it, it really dramatically increases the, the scope of, of outrage expression and makes it a lot easier. And of course, because we are connected with others on social networks, if our friends see us expressing outrage and they like it, and of course they probably will because one way to signal your sort of solidarity with somebody or shared group identity is to give positive feedback for moral expressions. And my collaborator, Billy Brady, and, he's, and his colleagues at, at NYU have shown that um, expressions of moral emotions get the most likes and retweets on Twitter. Um, this means that if you express outrage and you're getting a lot of positive feedback from your friends, that probably is gonna make you more likely to express it again in the future. And what's even more interesting is thinking about the literature on habit formation. So habits are behaviors that are expressed without regard to their consequences. So if you're doing something habitually, you're not really thinking about it in a deliberative way. You're just kind of responding to a stimulus. And the quickest way to establish a habit for a particular behavior is to reward that behavior randomly, to deliver rewards at, at random unexpected times. And of course, this is exactly how we get positive social feedback on social media. We're getting these likes and retweets at unpredictable times. And so our hypothesis that we're testing, we don't have an answer yet, is whether this kind of reinforcement of outrage expression on social media might actually make the expression of outrage over the long term more habitual. So are people reading headlines that trigger outrage and then they're just sharing those to their friends without really thinking about, well, is this true? Is this timely? Is it relevant? And I, I have a really embarrassing story, which is uh, shortly after the 2016 elections, I was you know, spending a lot of time on social media and somebody in my network posted a story that was uh, unflattering for the other political party and um, I very quickly skimmed the article and shared it and one of my friends commented that this was an over five-year-old article and was totally out of context and I thought it was you know recently published so you know that at least introspectively seemed like I had gotten sucked into this feedback loop and was kind of sharing information without really deliberatively considering it. And that was a wake-up call for me. I was like, oh God, well, you know, and I've, I actually work on these types of issues. Um, and if I'm not immune to them, then uh, how, can, how can we expect anyone to, to, to be immune to them? So, um, so yeah, the, the last component of social media design that, that might also be influencing the way we, we share these things, and particularly uh, this applies to political outrage. We know that people do sort themselves on social networks according to similarity. So liberals are more likely to be connected with liberals, conservatives with conservatives, and it's also been shown by Billy Brady and colleagues that uh, outrage about, well, moral emotions in general related to political issues are shared more within the in-group than between groups. So liberals are sharing moral emotions more with other liberals than conservatives and vice versa. And so, you know, for, for political content in particular, it's not the case that expressing outrage is sort of diffusing 
uniformly throughout society, but it's 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 diffusing in a in a more segregated way because of the way that the networks are structured. Yeah, it's tricky. So I mean, the evidence for echo chambers is mixed, and it's, it's a quite controversial topic in in sort of media and communication studies. On the one hand, the sort of what you might call the extreme version or view of echo chambers, where there's like a hermetic, like a hermetically sealed liberal bubble and a hermetically sealed conservative bubble and information stays completely within each bubble and doesn't get across, like that can't be true. We know that's not true from our own experience. Even if I don't watch Fox News, I know what's going on on Fox News, in part because people in my network are, are critical of, of that content and vice versa, right? So like we clearly are not in the extreme version of the echo chamber. Um, and, 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 and the notion of, of filter bubble as well, like I might prefer to read articles about you know, viewpoints that, that comport with my own political viewpoint, but I'm also very aware of the many viewpoints that exist across the political spectrum, and I think anyone who's politically engaged is, is gonna be at least minimally aware of that. So then the question is, well, what, version of echo chambers is true. I think, I think there must be at least on some level a version that's true at the level of discourse. So it seems like an intuitive aspect of human nature that if you're gonna talk trash about someone you disagree with, you're gonna do that with someone who you agree with and who you know probably also disagrees with that other viewpoint. And I think that the data that Billy and his colleagues have shown that, that moral emotions are spreading um, within political, uh, politically homogenous networks more than between is, is some evidence for that. Like if you're expressing outrage about something that the other side has done, you're gonna be expressing that to people who already agree with you. So the question of what can be done about this, I mean, I, I think that the, the studies that have, have shown just getting people to be more exposed to the opposing viewpoint uh, suggests that this is not the best strategy. But I, I think that that proposal was a, a potential solution to a problem that probably doesn't exist. Like the solution of we should just expose people to more viewpoints as a solution to the problem of the hermetically sealed version of echo chambers, which I think is not plausible. So I think that we ultimately need to know a lot more about the more fine-grained dynamics of political and emotional discourse online before we can start to come up with solutions. There's a more complicated version of the model that is going to be more supported by data, and we need to find out what that model is in order to come up with solutions to the issue of polarization. I think that's a really smart way to think about it, and certainly fits with the way I've been thinking about outrage in social media. If algorithms that determine what we see are selecting for the most outrage-provoking content, then they're not gonna show liberals the like reasonable conservatives whose viewpoints are close to their own. They're gonna show the, the cartoon villain version of conservatives and vice versa. So conservatives are not gonna be seeing the, the viewpoints from liberals that would, would engender compromise and harmony. They're gonna see the, the cartoon villain, villain like crazy versions of, of, of liberals that are most likely to engender outrage on that side. So, you know, this is of course, I should say, not new to social media. Talk radio and, you know, political cable television shows have capitalized on this insight for decades. So this really predates social media. I think the, like, one difference is that the, the content is now coming from users as well as from the, the shock jocks and the, and the talking heads. 
Sure. So the basic idea behind signaling, and this is a, a simplified version, is that expressions of outrage are thought to be honest signals of underlying character and work by folks like Pat Barkley, Dave Rand, Jill Jordan have shown that people who express outrage in response to moral transgressions are more likely to be trusted by observers and people who don't express outrage. And people who express outrage are actually more trustworthy than people who don't. So outrage expression is, is a, a valid or an honest signal of underlying moral character. And this solves a useful problem for sort of social life in the sense that like we have to decide who to affiliate with and who not to. And we use those signals to make decisions about who we should choose as social partners. So what's important about the signaling perspective on out outrage is that it, it provides an alternative uh, sort of individual selection driven mechanism for how outrage could have evolved and, and Jill Jordan has evolutionary models showing this uh, with data and, and mathematically that if, if you express outrage or you know, if, you, if you punish uncooperative behavior that's costly to you but you make up for the cost by boosting your reputation and, and the gains that you get for, uh, for being chosen as a social partner outweigh the costs of, of punishing in the short term. Now, I think it's really important to distinguish here between what we might think of as an, an ultimate mechanism, so um, costly signaling as a mechanism through which our taste for outrage evolved, how natural selection over the course of history endowed us with the, the propensity to res respond with outrage to moral violations. Um, that needs to be distinguished from proximate mechanisms for outrage in the moment um, and, and why people punish wrongdoing in the moment. Virtue signaling gets a bad rap because it's a quite cynical take on outrage ex expression, right? It, it's sort of like there's there is a perspective on virtue signaling where um, if you're accused of virtue signaling, it's almost like being accused of lying or being disingenuous. Like you're not really outraged about that thing. The reason you're expressing outrage is because you want to signal your virtuous character to others. And I think that's, I think that could explain some outrage expressions, but I, I think it's unlikely to ex explain most. I, I think people, who are expressing outrage on social media are, are, are genuine. And I, I think genuine feelings of outrage and a sense of injustice is likely to explain the vast majority of those expressions in the proximate sense. That still leaves open the possibility that the reason we evolved a taste for, out, for outrage, the reason we respond to injustice in the way that we do is because over the course of evolutionary history, our ancestors who did that were more popular and had more offspring, and that's why now most people will respond with outrage to uh, perceptions of moral violations. So, you know, I, I think it's really important not to confuse the ultimate and the proximate when explaining human behavior. And just because virtue signaling could be an explanation for why we have outrage, that doesn't mean that every time outrage is expressed, people are actively thinking about their reputation. And it's, it's an open question, what is motivating outrage expression in the moment? Outrage expression is a multiply determined kind of, of behavioral expression. It could be motivated by reputation and also a genuine sense of injustice, and also you know just like a, a sense of just desert, wanting to take revenge on that person. You know there are many motivations that can give rise, rise to shaming, punishment behavior, and outrage expression in general. And probably in the mind of any individual expressing outrage in a given moment, there are going to be lots of different motivations operating: some above consciousness, some below consciousness, and and you know that's not even to speak of of the possibility that some of these expressions are habitual, which is to say like maybe not even based in emotion at all, but just a, a behavioral sort of tapping the retweet button because in the past when you retweeted outrageous expressions, 
you got likes for it and there's now a stimulus response link somewhere in your brain that makes that more likely response to that stimulus in the future. That's really hard because if there's anything we've learned from social psychology in the past 50 plus years, we're really bad at knowing why we do the things that we do. And we've looked at this in the context of, of punishment actually. So we studied uh, punishment of unfair behavior and we've contrasted two different types of punishment. Open punishment that is able to teach a lesson to somebody else because if you punish them, they know they've been punished and they know it's because they did something unfair. And we contrast that with punishment in secret where the person who's being punished uh, gets, gets a financial penalty, but they don't know that they're being punished. So if you're the punisher, you get the satisfaction of knowing that they've been punished, but they can't learn a lesson. So it's purely retributive. And so we measure how much people punish in this more deterrent style punish punishment and this more retributive style punishment. And then afterwards, we ask people, how much did you punish because you wanted to teach somebody a lesson? And how much did you punish because you just wanted to take revenge because it felt good? And people, of course, endorse quite strongly teaching a lesson and they're very unwilling to endorse the revenge motive. But if you look at those self-reports and how they correlate with the actual behavior, what you find is that self-reports of deterrence motives correlate very well with deterrence behavior, but self-reports of retributive mo motives correlate not at all with retributive behavior. So you have a disconnect between what people are sort of willing or able to report about why they punish and their actual behavior, which suggests to me that introspection about punishment is very much uh, shaped by the social desirability of these different motives. So I think it will be difficult to discern by asking people whether they're expressing outrage to signal something about their reputation or because they genuinely care about the, the, the issue at hand. And these are not mutually exclusive. They can operate in parallel. So you know, it, it might be both, and it might be that one is more conscious and the other is more unconscious. So th these are tricky questions. It's a very complicated issue, right? I think there are as many, if not more, normative questions than there are descriptive questions in, in the context of putting morality into AI. And one, one perspective that has come up in these kinds of conversations is that our work on preferences for different types of moral agents suggests that people find deontological or specifically contractualist agents more trustworthy than utilitarian agents, that does raise questions about, well, even if you were to decide from a normative perspective that you wanted to make AI utilitarian, that you, know, you got together your dream team of philosophers and you sort of survey all the possible styles of, of decision making you could program into an AI and you, you decide that you know, utilitarianism is really the way to go. You face an issue of trust where for AI to realize its promise for humanity, you need humans to accept it. And if you've chosen a style of decision making that is demonstrated to be untrustworthy for many people, then that in itself is gonna be a roadblock to achieving your utilitarian aim of greatest good for the greatest number through the AI implementation of utilitarian decisions, right? So it gets like quite complicated and I think there's still a lot more work to be done just in the basic psychology of moral perception and, and particularly around, around AI. Um, one thing that we're really interested in these days is explainability. So AI algorithms vary in terms of how explainable they are versus how like black box they are. And of course, for moral decisions, people really care about explanation. They care about understanding how an agent arrived at that decision. And in our work on, on utilitarian trust, 
we found that the way to mitigate distrust in utilitarian agents is for the utilitarian agent to say, well, even though I went with the utilitarian choice, it was a really hard decision, like I struggled with it. Then people find the utilitarian agent just as trustworthy as the deontological agent. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think it's discoverable also. It's probably going to be very co complicated and very context sensitive, but I think that, like discovering the, the utility function for morality for humans and how it's instantiated in the brain is something I expect we'll be able to make, you know, maybe not solve the whole problem, but make tremendous progress on within my lifetime.